Hey guys, it's Andrew Clampert, and today we're going to have a crash course in naive set theory. Alright, we're going to start with the definition of a set, and I define that as a collection of distinct objects of a common type. Alright, so the easiest way to think about a set, at least to me, is to think about a basket. And we're throwing these objects in. Now with the constraint of common type, well, you know, if we're dealing with numbers, we can only deal with numbers in that basket. And if we're dealing with, say, words, you know, strings, these, these things surrounded by parentheses, right, then we can only throw those objects into our basket. And if we wanted to make it even tighter, we could even say, you know, the set of animals, which, you know, could be giraffe, elephant, tiger, and so on and so forth, um, and we're throwing them in uniquely, uh, those can only be animals. So even though they may be in the world of strings, we're confining our basket to just animals. Alright, so while the basket visualization certainly helps get the idea across, it's nice to show the common convention, right? The common notation we use for sets. Alright, so typically the way we represent a set is designating some capital letter uh, to represent it, and we then have our objects encapsulated within curly brackets. And so order doesn't matter, and that's what the steps after this um, this base representation are trying to trying to give off, trying to tell you. So we see in this example, right, I've thrown in numbers um, to be specific, just integers. And so in in the base we have two, three, seven, eleven, negative thirteen, three, fourteen, and two. But we know that we need distinct objects, so we we have different ways of filtering. So we can represent it, this set as two, three, seven, eleven, negative thirteen, fourteen, or three, seven, eleven, negative thirteen, fourteen, two. Or even 2, 7, 11, negative 13, 3, 14. And there's other representations we could have. I just wanted to put emphasis on, on just how arbitrary order is with a set. Right? It's, all, it's just all about having that common type and that uniqueness. Alright, so... Here I've made somewhat of a Venn diagram where A corresponds to the, the green circle, B corresponds to the blue circle, and V corresponds to the circle containing both of these sets A and B. Now, A is not defined as it was in our previous example. I've just chosen A as just some arbitrary set here. So surrounding our... I guess Venn diagram, we have some definitions, right? We have this upside down U corresponding to intersection or and. We have this, this U corresponding to union or or. It's an inclusive or, not typically the way we use it in when we're speaking English, like this option or the other. And then we have this kind of sideways U uh, where we have the closed off piece pointing to the left. Um, we have that to designate a subset. And then rotating it 180 degrees that designates superset. And then when we talk about this backslash that's going to be exclude or less. 
don't worry, I'm going to write down some examples in just a moment. And then when we talk about a to this seeming exponent of c, that's going to be the same as a with a bar above it, or this tilde a, which we can look at as not a, or the complement of a. So when we talk about intersection, right, let's say we're dealing with A intersect B. We're going to be dealing with this region right here. Okay, so if we're dealing with A intersect B, that is going to be the section that the, the section of elements that both A and and B share. Now, if we're if we're talking about the union of A and B, right? A or B, then th what we're going to be dealing with is all of the elements in A right that aren't in B all of the elements that A and B share, and then all of the elements in B that are not in A. So we try not to double count the elements. We know, we know intrinsically that the sets are going to be, you know, a collection of distinct objects. So when we look at A union B, Right, that's going to be a set of distinct objects, so we'll never have a repeat. So we don't have to worry about when we're dealing with this overlap here. Alright, so now if we want to talk about the complement of A, we're going to be dealing with all elements that are not within this set. That are not within A. So... We'll be dealing with all of the elements in B that are not shared with A. So we ignore the intersection between the two sets. And we're going to deal with all elements that are not in A or B. Right? Obviously, I can shade this in more, but this gets the idea across. And of course, if we want to deal with B complement, well, we just get rid of the scribbling in this section of B and just move it over to A. And then... You know, we can even complement a union, and then we're just dealing with all of these elements that are outside both of these sets. Okay, so now if we wanted to talk about A less B or A exclude B, We'd simply be dealing with A intersecting B complement, right? So A and not B. So we discussed A complement before, right? That's going to be everything that is not an A. If we talk about A and B complement, right? B complement we know would be everything that's not in B. And so then if we intersect that with A, we're just going to be left with the section of A that is not shared with B. Okay. And of course, when we talk about B less A, right, we're going to have B intersect A complement. We just move this scribbling over to this section of B. Alright, so I have gone ahead and I've erased the definition that I wrote for complement and replace it with the definition of disjoint sets, which are sets that share no elements with each other. And you'll see that I've now added a set C inside of V that shares no elements with A or B. 
So I won't be able to really show just how powerful this can be uh, in this video, um, but this notion really, really comes in handy. Um, but what we can say is that, you know, if we look at the intersection of A with C, that'll produce what we call the empty set, which is a set that contains no elements. It's just curly brackets containing air. That's it. Now, if we wanted to talk about B intersected with C, we would get the same result. We would get the empty set. But talking about V intersected with C, we just get C. Now, using the notation for subset, we have that V intersect C equals C, since C is a subset of V. Alright, so we can also say that V is a superset of C. Right? But you'll more commonly see the notation of a set being a subset of another. Alright, so now we're going to talk about the power set. And when we talk about the power set, that's going to be the set of all subsets. Usually, and by usually I mean always, we apply it onto a set and it'll be the set of all subsets for that set. So if we're talking about A, the power set of A, right? Um, let's say that A just contains the elements 2, 3, right? Um, then if we wanted to talk about the subsets, then we would have the empty set, that's inherently in every single set, um, talk about the single element 2 being contained in a set, the single element 3 being contained in a set, and then A itself, okay, because we know that a set can just contain itself, right? And in this situation, we could say, okay, 2 for instance, belongs to the power set of A, right? Because it's, it's going to be an element of the power set. We can say 3 as a set belongs to the power set of A as well, right? And this is, this is where the notation differs, right? Because now these sets are being treated as these objects, okay? So, of course, we have this analogous nature when it comes to subset of and contains, but we still need to make that distinction. Again, it might be a little confusing. I know this stuff's a little dense, and I have to move a little quick, but with time, this stuff will sink in very nicely. All right, well, that's all I have for today, guys. Um, I hope this was helpful to you, uh, and I'll see you in the next video.